Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See detail. There's no better feeling than a personal win. And the State Farm Personal Price Plan can help you do just that. Talk to a State Farm agent today to learn how you can bundle and save with the personal price plan. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices are based on rating plans that vary by state. Coverage options are selected by the customer. Availability, amount of discounts and savings, and eligibility vary by state. What just happened to the San Francisco 49ers today? They fall to the Arizona Cardinals after another second half collapse against an NFC West opponent in 2024. They lose 24 to 23. They fall to 2 and 3 on the NFL season. Now, right now, 0 and 2 against the NFC West, setting up a pivotal week 6 matchup against the Seattle Seahawks in Seattle this Thursday night, and this is a infuriating loss for the San Francisco 49ers. It's a game they had in the bag. It feels just like that Rams loss did a couple of weeks ago. You have it. You're ahead by double digits. You're ahead in the second half. Everything is leaning your direction, and in the feels like a blink of an eye. You don't have the lead, and you lose. You can feel this one slipping away drive by drive every time San Francisco couldn't get into the red zone couldn't score once they got to the red zone it was like oh my goodness uh, they're gonna lose this game we'll dive into all of it today Brock Purdy struggles the red zone issues why can't this offense that has Debo Samuel and George Kittle and Jordan Mason and Brandon Ayuk why can they not put the ball in the end zone, we'll talk about the good stuff. Brandon Ayuk, talk about the defense today, what they did on third and fourth down, and why there was actually some good things to react to. But don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And tell me what you thought of this game down below. What did you make of San Francisco's 24-23 loss against the Arizona Cardinals in Week 5 of the NFL season? San Francisco's 2-3. and three. What do you make of their season so far? Tell me down below in the comments. And without further ado, let's dive into San Francisco's Week 5 loss against the Cardinals. And to put it bluntly, this sucks. This just plainly, simple as can be, sucks. The San Francisco 49ers should be 5-0. They have not played good football, maybe outside of one game, against the New England Patriots last week this season. The Niners right now are not a good football team. And for a roster that has and boasts all this talent, it is mind-numbing that they continue to play down to bad opponents. San Francisco played down to a terrible Rams team that is currently 1-4, with their only win being against the San Francisco 49ers, the Cardinals, who last week got 42 points put up against their defense against the Washington Commanders, walked into Levi Stadium, went down by double-digit points, and clawed and climbed their way back in the blink of an eye. A loss like this sets San Francisco back so much. The Seattle Seahawks lost. The Giants took care of business in Seattle. It would have set up a not winner take all, but whoever wins this Thursday at Lumen Field in Seattle, whoever wins that game is now in first place in the NFC West. That's no longer on the table. Now, because Seattle lost, uh, you can argue there is no harm, no foul here, but you didn't pick up a game. San Francisco continues to waste opportunities to 
pick up games in the NFC West. And the optimistic fan in me wants to say, well, 2021, they were 3-5, and five, and they, they found their way to the NFC Championship game. In 2022, they were 4-4. Four and four. They picked themselves back up and found their way back to the NFC Championship game. But those, those seasons don't come every year. Those are hard-fought not once in a lifetime, but certainly once in a decade type victories and type seasons where you can claw your way back to go to the playoffs. This team is nowhere near the competitor, nowhere near the talent those teams had. This team has catastrophic issues that no one really knew what to make of them the first couple weeks of the season. Week one is kind of okay. Week one, you're getting your feet wet. Your starters don't play in the preseason, but you're now a month and one week into the NFL season. The San Francisco 49ers wins thus far. Week one against the Jets, week four against the Patriots. Funny enough, two AFC East teams that are so inconsistent and really the Patriots are one of the worst teams in football. Those are the outliers. San Francisco has played in three of their losses more consistently bad than had than they played in 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 their, in their wins. Like if I asked you who are the San Francisco 49ers in 2024, you can't point to the Patriots win or the Jets win. You have to point to games like this because these ones are becoming far too uh common occurrences. Games like this last year are games San Francisco wins by 25 points. This year, these are games where San Francisco lose by one. Now, you can argue that, okay, it's a one-point loss. Many of their losses this year have been by one score. In fact, all of them have been by one score, basically. You can argue that Brock Purdy in his post-game press conference saying that it's a couple plays here or there. Okay, if you want to buy into that, fine. San Francisco technically is a couple plays away from scoring 30 points a game, but Going through this game, and we have plenty of comments already. Bobo says here in the comments on YouTube that I think Kyle Shanahan can't hold a 10-point lead to save his life. I am beginning to think Steve Wilkes wasn't the problem. We'll dive into in, in, into the defense later on in the show, but yeah, like what's like what is up with the number 10 this year? In previous years, it was Jimmy Garoppolo, Kyle Williams, pre-Kyle Shanahan. 10-point leads have haunted Kyle Shanahan. This year, Ronnie Bell's dropping passes wearing number 10 that would have clinched you a game against the Rams or maybe helped you win a game against the Rams. Like, number 10 is, like, steer clear of that number. Uh, Niner Stoback says, what's up? Also says, they ain't winning jack squat, basically. And I think that's where we have to start today. The San Francisco 49ers, as of right now, and Lori Matthews says here they should be 4-1. and one. They have to stop giving games away. Special teams absolutely sucks. And unfortunately, Lori, while you're right for the most part, special teams got you seven points today. They blocked a kick. It was Jordan Elliott blocked a field goal, got you seven points, got you a, an extended lead going into halftime. Special teams weren't the issue today. And had you had Jake Moody, had you not gotten hurt, you'd probably win this game, sure, but... Special teams was not the issue at all, which it has been. Not today, though. The offense was just... Whatever team walked out of the tunnel to begin the game and then walked into halftime was not the same team that walked out of the tunnel. It was like San Francisco got zapped. It was like the Monstars were there from Space Jam and it made them all touch a football. And what Purdy was doing in the first half what Ayuk was doing in the first half, it was just like, gone. This was a simple tale of two halves. We talked about this the Cardinals' defense coming into this game, how it ranked 30th in all of football, 29th against the past. Uh, they were allowing 149 yards per game on the ground in the first four weeks of the season. They had five defenders with a 100-plus passer rating allowed. And I'm sitting here gushing like, oh my goodness, this is a game for the offense to explode. If the Commanders can put up 42 points against the Cardinals defense, San Francisco should at least be able to put up 30. That was not the case at all. San Francisco's offense was moving the football at will 
in this game for the betterment of three quarters, if you will. And every time they got in the red zone, they got in the red zone six times, scored a touchdown once. And I think that is the one of the biggest issues we are seeing thus far. Uh, I was hosting Niners post game show on 95.7 The Game, and my co-host asked me, if there's one thing you could change about this team, what would it be? And my mind was like, well, if you change the defense, you know, on third downs and fourth downs, you improve the run defense, cool. The offense should run into form if or whenever CMC comes back. But then I thought, you know what? Like, what equates to wins? We tend to make football this really complicated game. And it certainly is. Calling plays, you listen to Kyle Shanahan's playbook and what Brock Purdy has to repeat to the rest of the team on offense. It's this long, drawn-out, like, like what? <laughs> I can't repeat that. My mind can't even comprehend that stuff. And football is complicated. It's very complex. But football, in its very simplest form, is basically score more points than the opposition. San Francisco's offense knowing that their defense is not what it once was in previous years for a variety of reasons, injuries being a major part of that, no Greenlaw, no Hargrave in this game, Jair Brown got hurt, Tano Hufunga got hurt. There's areas you can point to and say, okay, you don't have your starters. The offense has not picked up the slack. And in a game like this where we knew that there could be a potential for some fireworks, right? There could be potential for... Um, I don't want to say a shootout, but you know the Cardinals' offense is not not bad. Kyler Murray is a good quarterback. They have the weaponry. It's just that they've been really inconsistent. They've been a first half team, not a second half team. If you're the Cardinals, you walk away, yes, with the win, but like, hey, that was our best game of the season. We fought back down double digits. We played a complete game. Uh, James Conner got going in the second half, and San Francisco just crumbled and fell apart when it mattered most. And, like, my goodness, let's start here in my notes with Brock Purdy, okay? Brock Purdy in this game, I thought, started out really well. He was zipping the ball around left and right. He was having himself a good game, uh, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me of first half, second half, but first half got a touchdown to George Kittle. Um, Running around, he he broke two guys' ankles when he was scrambling. It's like, yes, like Brock Purdy looks like he's going to continue the MVP level play he's been on against a bad defense, mind you. But yes, Brock Purdy's on his game. And as soon as that second half began... After finding Ayuk for over 100 yards in the first half, finding Kittle for a touchdown, scoring some points, walking into halftime of this one up, you know, 23 to 10. You're in a great position, really great position to continue and build your lead. And it was like just a complete stop. It was like there was a dam, and by halftime, it was built up, and this the flow completely stopped. Chemistry was gone. The ability to make plays with the legs were gone. He's, Brock Purdy, this is a tale of two different quarterbacks in this game. Go back and watch that first half. Brock looks incredible. Zipping the ball around, tight window throws, not making turnover-worthy plays, not pressing, playing freely, pushing the ball down the field, like making the right play at the right time. And as soon as that second half starts, it was a tailspin. That old TV show, the old cartoon on, I don't know what it was, like back in my day it was Toon Disney, but my goodness, my brother who's 40-something years old, he watched Tailspin. It was a complete and utter tailspin. Like, what the heck happened? Second half, he's turning the ball over twice, two picks, one pick, the first one especially, was like a lazy flick of the wrist throw. I get it got tipped, but it was like, oh my goodness, like what is, like... In these moments, that's the throw you're making. Uh, He's running around scrambling, trying to make these big-time plays, which inherently isn't a bad thing. But we talk about Brock Purdy in a a good light the majority of the time, and rightfully so. I think Brock Purdy is an excellent quarterback. I think he's a top-10 quarterback. I think that Brock Purdy can take this team and win a Super Bowl with the current roster 
and the offense can score 30 points a game once again with him at quarterback. But, you know, we, in regards to how Brock Purdy plays, his play style, it's very gunslinger-like, right? Where, yeah, he'll, you know, he'll, he'll make the on-time throw, the slants, the end-arounds. He'll do the things that Shanahan's offense is known for, right? He'll play in the system, but he will also take calculated risks, right? Uh, go back to the game against Pittsburgh in week one last year. He's throwing the ball on precision to Brandon Ayuk downfield. He's he's making these you know, deep level throws against the Commanders late last season. He's doing the things it takes to win games and makes that the things that make quarterbacks special. He's a gunslinger. He'll take risks if it's worth the reward, right? And Brock's great at that stuff. But I don't know if it's he needs to get reined back in, but Brock in this game felt like he was running wild and not in a not in a good way. I wouldn't say I was worried when he dropped back, but it was like whoa, like not that Kyle has to give him the the, the Jimmy G treatment and run the football forty five times a game. You know, Brock's better than that, but this is a game where Brock felt out of control at times. And we haven't said that much about him. Um, the Niners offense has kind of gotten away from who they are. You listen to Brock Purdy in his post-game press conference, and Lori Matthews says here on the YouTube chat that uh, they need to get back to basics, work together, stop making bonehead mistakes, and play complimentary football. Brock said it in his post-game press conference that you know they, they don't have their identity offensively yet. And it's like, well, wait a minute. It's you're five weeks into the NFL season. You haven't had Christian McCaffrey the entirety of training camp, the entirety of preseason, and even if you thought he can suit up against the Jets week one, you knew that Friday he wasn't going to play, and you knew after that game it was only getting worse, and now he's on IR. The, the offense you currently have has been the same offense you've had since... I don't know, June, July, what's the excuse to not have your offensive identity down to a T? And I get Kittle missed a game, Debo missed a game. Okay, in that game itself, it makes sense to kind of be off. But in that game itself, you had a 10-point lead in the fourth quarter against a terrible Rams defense. The idea that San Francisco it doesn't have an, an offensive identity is not because Christian McCaffrey is not here. They willingly have gotten away from who they are. Which, no one's saying pound the rock 45 times. It's simply just, why is Brock Purdy dropping back seven-step drops on first downs? Why are you throwing the football three times in a row in the red zone? These things that are happening, the plays that are being called, are not what Shanahan has done the past five seasons. They've actually been winning football games. It's... It's almost like head shaking. Tom Brady today on the broadcast for Fox kept saying, like, why are they not utilizing play action? You have Jordan Mason, who has been one of the best running backs in football this year, who against the defense that, again, allows 149 yards per game, utilize play action. This offense has been known to run the rock 30, 25 plus times, utilize play action, get Ayuk and Kittle and Debo open utilizing PA, getting the defense to bite, and you hit big plays downfield. Where is that? Brock, for all the great things he can do, I don't think you can put any quarterback in this offense right now. And sure, Mahomes was maybe, Josh Allen maybe, but it's like uh, most quarterbacks could not succeed in this offense. Like it's not a Brock Purdy thing in, you know, entirely. It's an offensive issue. And Niners Throwback says here, so where is the leadership accountability? When will this team stop getting tired of losing? And I don't think it's the idea of getting tired of losing, but you are five weeks into the NFL season. You can point fingers at Jordan Mason for fumbling in the red zone, sure. You can point fingers at dumb throws by Brock Purdy. Yep, makes sense. Thumbs up from me. Criticize the quarterback. But when it comes to... Offensive miscues, play calling, like, and all of this can be summed up in the red zone play calling. Go back and look at San Francisco's red zone play calling in this game. It's utterly atrocious, and it has been the majority of the season. 
after this game was over with, okay, San Francisco with Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle, Juwan Jennings, Jordan Mason, and Brock Purdy, they rank 30th, 30th. They have the third worst red zone offense in football. Huh? <laughs> what? They are scoring touchdowns on 40.9% of their drives inside their opponent's 20. They are scoring on less than 50% of their red zone opportunities. They've scored touchdowns on only 6 of 12 goal-to-go situations. That ranks 50th, excuse me, that is 50%. That ranks second worst in football. Last year, 82.9%. Oh, such a clutch off-season pickup, Dave. I was worried we'd bring back the same team. I meant those blackout motorized shades. Blinds.com made it crazy affordable to replace our old blinds. Hard to install? No, it's easy. I installed these and then got some from my mom. She talked to a design consultant for free and scheduled a professional measure and install. Hall of Fame son. They're the number one online retailer of custom window coverings in the world. Blinds.com is the GOAT. Shop Blinds.com's primetime kickoff event. Save up to 50% off select styles, plus doorbusters. Rules and restrictions may apply. That's not a Christian McCaffrey's out issue. Yes, CMC elevates your offense entirely. Reigning Offensive Player of the Year any team he plays for will see a boost with him on the field, for sure. That, though, that number of the second worst in goal-to-go situations in football and the 30th-ranked Red Zone offense in the league, that is not a CMC thing. I want to run through every single or the big Red Zone uh, plays they had. Two situations, two opportunities to either get a bigger lead or be aggressive. And it I think tells a a really you know important part of what's missing here. Okay, game scenario. The game is tied 10 to 10. Okay? You're on the opponents uh you're inside the red zone. Goal to go, okay? First down, first goal to go. Grendo runs for 3 yards. Purdy then completes the next pass to George Kittle, which this is the pass where he caught it but it wasn't a great throw by Purdy, and Kittle was trying to get to the pylon, but just couldn't get there because it was a weird throw. But okay, it's third and two. You're in a really good spot. Third and two. You are going to score a touchdown. Guaranteed, right? No. For whatever reason, they call a passing play on third and two. Purdy's running around like, where do I go? No one's open, which has happened far too often this season, and he throws it away. Fourth and two, settle for a field goal. Okay, it's 13 to 10, but in retrospect, in, in hindsight, what if you score a touchdown there? Like Bobo says here, Kyle Shanahan will never take accountability for his failures. I don't think it's about taking accountability. I don't think it's about making a public statement of, I messed up. I think it's simple as, what we're doing is not working. And there's clear reasons as to why. Going back to this scenario. Okay, it's third and two. You cannot tell me in an offense that has Jordan Mason and Debo Samuel, who touched the ball only four freaking times in this game. And I'm not someone that says force feed your stars unnecessarily. But we've gotten to a point where this offense needs to have some sense of desperation. When San Francisco beat the Jets, people were saying, Kyle, be more aggressive. Week two against the Vikings, what was he? More aggressive. And they lost that game, sure, but their issues aren't just, oh, they didn't convert on fourth down. It's on third and two. Why are you throwing the football? I'm sorry. Can Kyle Juszczyk, the same player you trusted, to get you a third and one, a third and two, in the NFC Championship game against the Rams in 2021 on a fullback dive, you trust him then to get you one or two yards, but you don't trust him against a Cardinals defense that's getting up 149 yards per game in the red zone to get you two yards and a touchdown? What? Debo Samuel, who again, touched the ball four times in this game for a total of 20 yards. Maybe he's injured, no one said anything in the postgame. 
Why are we not feeding our stars? If that was the Baltimore Ravens, you know what they do? Here, Derrick Henry, get me one yard on third down, then at least get me one more yard on fourth down. You know what you do? You make the opposing team, who's on their heels, who has one of the worst run-defending defenses in football, make them stop you. It's almost like, I don't know if it's the look the defense is giving them. I don't know if Purdy is canning plays. I don't think he is. doesn't seem to be that way. But why are you not just saying, you know what? I got Trent Williams. I got Aaron Banks. I got Dominic Pooney. Cold McKivitz for as bad as he's a, as a pass protector. He's a heck of a run, def- a, a run blocker. And you have George Kittle, one of the best blocking tight ends in football. And Kyle Juszczyk, an amazing fullback. Whether it's Debo gets one carry or Mason gets one carry. Why are we not being aggressive on third and two at the goal line? Last year, that's two CMC runs back-to-back, bang, touchdown. And the fact is, you don't even need CMC to be that aggressive to execute in these situations. Other teams, 31 other teams, do not have Christian McCaffrey. Yet they're going for it on third and two and fourth and two. And it's not to criticize Kyle for being conservative or aggressive. Kyle's a heck of a head coach. He's a smart guy. But again, sometimes football gets so complicated and we make it so complicated when it's simply just hike ball, hand ball off, score touchdown, caveman style, pound the rock. Like no one's saying... You know, go back to Mike Allstott and Michael Pippen. No one's saying go back to the the Buccaneers era of football where it's like they're just pounding the rock a bunch of times because they can. It's just being smart and utilizing your stars in the way they can succeed. The Ravens force opposing offenses or defenses to stop them. Today, for example, perfect example of this. The Dolphins are playing the New England Patriots. The Dolphins suck. The quarterback's hurt. They can't move the football. It's Skylar Thompson. Now it's Tyler Huntley. They're terrible. They can't move the football. Somehow, they get in the red zone. They're on the Patriots. Goal to go. What do they do? You know what? Devon A. Chain got hurt in this game. We're not moving the football. We have to get creative and aggressive. We have to make sure, get desperate to score touchdowns. We never know when we'll be back here at the goal line, at the red zone. They give the ball to Alec Ingold, their fullback. What happens? He scores a touchdown. (laughs) Why are we not doing that? And I understand Kyle's a smart dude. He's a head coach in the NFL for one of the most successful teams of all time. He's been to countless NFC Championship games, been to two Super Bowls, in San Francisco alone. I don't even care you lost. I do care, but the outcome is irrelevant to him being a great head coach and a great offensive play caller. Like, 19 other teams are running Shanahan-style schemes because they want to mimic what you're doing. But sometimes football can just be simple as get your stars the ball. There is no excuse for a team like this to not be executing in the red zone. If there's any area on the field, this offense with these stars should be running like a freshly oiled machine. It is the red zone. When it's all gas, no brakes, it should be the red zone. You have the opposition on their heels, long drives, they're breathing. Give me the oxygen. It's 100 degrees outside. Run the damn football, man. (laughs) And and look, I'm not someone that is yelling at Kyle like, run the ball, run the ball. But in these situations, third and two, why are we passing the football? You run the ball, even if they stop you, let's say it's third and two, you run with Mason or Debo, they stop you. Run it again, they stop you. Kudos to those guys, they stop you. What changes? Oh, it's 10 to 10 still. Whatever. No one's saying be hyper-aggressive. It's just, this is a simple football-minded things. 
the worst that can happen is they stop you and have to march 99 yards the other way to score, which can happen, already happened this year once, but the odds it happens again? (laughs) I mean, come on. Like, football, for as complicated as it might be, is really, really simple. Score more points than the opposition means you win the game. How do you score more points? Giving your ball to the Stars to get you in the end zone on 3rd and 2 and 4th and 2 in the red zone. It's like, huh? And if that makes you say, well, Sterling, there's this and that and there's context, go to another situation. San Francisco is leading 23-13. to 10-point lead, great. They've been here before. Time to put the kill shot in. Put the night-night celebration on cue and get some points and put the Cardinals away. It's in the second half. First down, run by Mason. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Doesn't get much, but still. At this point, Jake Moody, he ain't in the game. You don't have a kicker. You're like, uh, we can't get three. We either have to score a touchdown or to Kyle Shanahan's point in his post-game press conference, get to like the 14-yard line to give Wisnowski an opportunity to get you a field goal. Okay, cool. First down, Mason gets the run, kind of gets stuffed, but okay. He gets one yard. The second play, it's going to be a pass. False start, Jawan Jennings. Okay, it's second 14. Second 14, what happens? And this is a dual Shanahan issue, and it's a big Brock Purdy issue. It's second 14, you're up by 10 in the opponent's red zone. It's a passing play. Not opposed to a passing play here, but it should be something simple and easy. Get you a manageable third and fourth down. You can't kick a field goal. It's four down territory. What do you have to do? Make third and fourth down easy for your offense, which in this case it should be easy for how many freaking stars you have. Second and 14, Purdy running left, right, circling around. Then he gets sacked. You cannot take a sack in that situation, Brock. It's having the wherewithal to what is my situational awareness. And this is something that has haunted San Francisco for a long time. Brock Purdy is not the the first player, nor is he the first example of this. But in this moment, second 14, you can't take a sack. I'd rather you have second and 14 than what became an eventual third and 23, then a fourth and 23. San Francisco gets this 10-point lead and then runs backwards the rest of the second half. But okay, this situation here, having situational awareness, right? This goes back to the Ravens in 2019, and it goes back to freaking the Super Bowl this past year and in 2019 as well. Like, Shanahan, for as great as he is, he himself does not have great situational awareness and in this moment you have Brock on the mic or in the speaker call the play and say or or before you give Brock the play Brock the last thing you can do is take a sack throw it away second and 14 I'll take third and 14 I will risk a Mitch Wisnowski 41 yard field goal whatever I'll try something else I can at least get myself on 3rd and 14 and 7 yards and give me a 4th and 7. I can do something that can aid my offense to help them. Okay, coach, I won't take a sack. And Brock, you can't take a sack, man. You have to stop playing hero ball for as great as Brock is and goes back to my first point earlier. Brock's a gunslinger. Sometimes I'd rather you not be a gunslinger and be a sniper. I'd rather you, yes, have the ability to take those shots downfield to hit them with precision and timing and put the kill shot in an opponent's head. Let's do that, Brock. I'm all for it. That's what you want from your elite quarterbacks. But the issue is Brock is acting like in the recent weeks, which at times he has to, but in this game especially, he's acting like he can empty the clip on downs one through four. When in reality, they're dropping eight guys, nine guys. They're not playing cover four, press coverage like they used to. The the Cardinals' defense walked into this game and changed what they were doing on tape. How do you respond? 
The Niners couldn't respond. They didn't respond. It was cool, 10-point lead, foot off the gas, hit the brake, and kind of coast your way down to a victory. It's really confusing because it's not just one thing. It's so many things. For Brock, again, can't take that sack. Like, like Be a sniper, not a shooter. Like I'd rather you have the sniper rifle that knows to breathe, compose yourself, then bang, hit that shot. Then have the machine gun just shoot and spray left and right, but you miss nine or ten times. You can't do that. That's not how you win football games. But then, okay, it's third and 23. What happens the very next play on third and 23? You have to pass the football, obviously. Ball gets tipped, bang, then incomplete to Kittle because he drops it on fourth and 23. And you're sitting there like, it was a tie game, you didn't give the ball to anybody, and you just played for a field goal, played conservative. Then you got almost hyper-aggressive when you didn't need to. So what is second and 14? Maybe if you call a run play, Juwan doesn't fall start. And obviously it's what could have been, right? You can always react post. But in these moments, Shanahan has to know better. Forget the look the opposing team's giving you. Force them to stop you. Don't don't stop yourself. That's what's transpiring. The Going back to the Ravens, they will make the opposing team prove they can stop Derrick Henry. Even in this game alone, San Francisco held James Conner in check for the most part in the first half. Second half, the Cardinals said, you know what? Uh, he's our go-to guy. He's the RB1. They're getting tired. Let's pound the rock. They ran the football 13 times for over 75 yards against San Francisco in the second half because they stuck to what they do best. In San Francisco, continually, not just in this game, against the Rams, against the Chiefs in both Super Bowls, Continue to let the opposing team dictate what they do. That is not having control of the game, despite having control of the scoreboard. Which makes no sense. That is not how football is played. I get you want to take one player here. You'll, t- you, you'll take a play on first down and you'll try something. Cool. I get that. I'm all for that. But... San Francisco, Kyle Shanahan, are letting the opposing teams dictate the game when the opposing team is down by 10 plus points in the second half. And because of that, San Francisco up 10 points going into halftime, 23 to 13 with no kicker, but with a Brock Purdy who was an MVP finalist last year, Jordan Mason coming into this game as the NFL's second leading rusher, Debo Samuel, who apparently isn't injured but wasn't featured at all, George Kittle, who had a touchdown in the first half, Ayuk, who was amazing in the first half, in the second half, he didn't score a single point. Not a single point was scored by San Francisco. San Francisco allowed the 30th ranked defense in football to shut them out in the second half. Huh? (laughs) Like, what the heck? And when you do that, and we have some comments here, uh, Bobo says, Kyle always does the shotgun uh, fourth and one in the red zone. Yeah, why? I formation that puppy. Make someone stop you. Uh, Niner Trump says here, Niners keep shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. For, like, if if I asked you, how many games has San Francisco lost or given away this year they've lost one game the vikings game they've given away two games now win loss column will say differently but san francisco gave away two nfc west divisional round games where they had a 10 point a 10 point lead twice they are their own worst enemy as niner trump says here as well on the youtube chat Lori matthew says here The Niners have always been successful when they run the football down their opponent's throat, control the clock, keep your defense fresh. That last point is what I want to get to here. Keep your defense fresh. Yeah. When uh, when your offense is not maintaining drives, sustaining drives, 
the Niners defense that is already missing in this game, no Javon Hargrave, no Yitir Gross Matos, no Dre Greenlaw, Hufunga gets hurt, Jair Brown gets hurt, but played pretty good in that first half. And in this game, if you look at the stats, I thought the defense in that first half was really good. Like, we all talked about, if you listen to the preview podcast, that the Cardinals will punch you in the mouth in that first quarter. It's how you respond. I thought San Francisco responded extremely well in that first uh, first half. San Francisco is down 7 to nothing. It's 3rd and 10. San Francisco gets some pressure on Kyler Murray, uh, which didn't happen really at all in this game, unfortunately. But you're down 7 nothing. It's 3rd and 10. Uh, your offense didn't score points on their drive. This can get ugly quick. You can be down by two scores quick. The defense answers. Get you the ball back. Cool. Now you're leading 10-7. to It's 3rd and 7. San Francisco blitzes. Ben don't break. They force the field goal. Cool. The defense is playing pretty well. Then San Francisco is leading um, uh, 20-10, to, to 10, right? Or excuse me, they're, they're leading 13-10, to 10, excuse me. Uh, it's 3rd and 6. Isaac Yadam has phenomenal coverage on Marvin Harrison Jr. He bats the ball down on 3rd and 6. The next play, blocked field goal Jordan Elliott. Lenore runs it for a touchdown. You're up 20-10. to 10. Your defense and special teams are rocking. They're doing their job. They're feeling their self. They're dancing. The 32nd ranked, the worst ranked special teams unit in football, which has been atrocious. Had a great punt coverage early in this game. Uh, George Odom got a nice tackle. They get the big block. They got just seven points. They're helping you out. They're doing things that don't happen every single Sunday. They're being a part of the winning, <laughs> which usually they're the reason why you're losing. Then, then San Francisco is leading 23-10. to Purdy throws the pick at his own 25-yard line. The defense then plays Ben Don't Break. Cardinals get a field goal. Wow, defense is playing phenomenal. Leading up to what became a terrible fourth quarter for San Francisco. Then late in the game, when your offense isn't scoring points, isn't sustaining drives, isn't doing what they need to do, isn't putting together you know five-minute drives, seven-minute drives, putting the game away, even if you won this game 23-20. You're up by two scores. Your defense has been on the field for a ton of time in that second half. Eventually, they have holes. They have injuries. They're going to break. I thought the defense played a heck of a game and gave San Francisco's offense every opportunity to put this one, uh, put the Cardinals out of their misery, to put the kill shot in the head. But late in the game... After holding the Cardinals' defense to 13 points and stopping them on third down a handful of times, third and seven, uh, the Cardinals complete a pass to, to Michael Wilson, who's wide open over the middle of the field. Then, boom, touchdown. Now it's 20 to 21. Oh, San Francisco, despite the offense that just in two consecutive drives threw a pick and, and Mason fumbles on third and five. They get the stop. They bat the ball down. Then Murray on fourth and five is running in circles and just heaves the bad boy up and is like, hey, look, whatever happens, happens. This is the game no matter what. And Marvin Harrison makes an amazing catch over Isaac Yadam. But even then, even then, the defense then bends and doesn't break again to give San Francisco, to give the Niners offense one more chance to score some points. Nick Bosa got the interception. I thought he was going to have a pick six. I was like, someone let him stiff arm Kyler Murray. Give me second overall pick on first overall pick crime here. Bosa gets a pick. When does the edge rusher get interceptions? It never happens. That sets up a field goal before halftime. It's like, yes, yes, yes. And the offense just continues to not put the ball in the end zone. The offense today played a good first half. But if I told you that I know the box score says 23 points, 
This offense only scored 16 points against the 30th worst defense in football. It's getting to a point where we have to in this entirely burn the paper. Uh, all the, well, they had the better quarterback and running back, and well, San Francisco ranks better here and there and the other. Forget all of it. It doesn't matter. San Francisco continually walks into games, gets leads, gives them up, and goes, we'll get them next time. You continue to lose games like this, they ain't going to be next time. San Francisco is 2-3. and three. This was the easy part of the schedule. This was the, whew, you got an easy chunk to begin because late it gets really scary because now you have Seattle in Seattle this Thursday, short rest. They lost. You lost. They want to get back to their form. You got to get a win to save your season. Then after that, you have Kansas City at your own place. And if history is to be believed, they don't kick your ass. And you got Dallas at home. They're kind of like, we don't know who we are. They're going to want to come in and beat you. And your defense is a lot worse than it was last year. And so is theirs. But it's like, who are these teams? That's a toss-up. Then you go to the bye week. Tampa Bay, Baker's crushing it. Mike Evans is having a heck of a year. And you have to eventually play. The Bills on the road in December. The Packers on the road in December. Seattle again. The Cardinals again. And the Rams again. What one of those games... Is a gimme. What one of those games has San Francisco proven through five games this year they can actually win that one? Before the year starts, we all go over, you know, print the schedule out, you know, pencil in the W's, right? Oh, San Francisco should be 11 and 6, 12 and 5. That game should be a win. This game should be a win. San Francisco has lost three of the games that were penciled in as victories this season. And. There's no penciled-in victories left on the schedule. It's a dogfight from here on out. San Francisco has dug themselves a hole. They're 2-3. and three. The world's not falling. It ain't you know, chicken little. The sky's falling. It ain't like that just yet. And I think Champy here, which thank you, Champy, for joining us here on the show. You're right. The Cards are a young, up-and-coming team. There'll be a wild card when it's all said and done. Just watch. I won't go that far. They're really inconsistent. But I told people this year, the Cardinals should not be taken lightly. That offense is young. They're fast. They're explosive. That defense sucks. But even then, the Cardinals made changes. The Cardinals' defense made the correct adjustments. You can tell... I think it was Kevin Burkhart and Tom Brady on the call were like, this is not what the Cardinals had been running through through four weeks in time. They changed what they usually do. They gave San Francisco a different look. And San Francisco's offense couldn't answer. And for the second time this season, uh, San Francisco's defense, one of their players has called out Nick Sorensen, not by name, but indirectly kind of been like, hey, look, like, you know, they're not 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 our fault, you know, kind of thing. Because against the Vikings, Charverius Ward called out Nick Sorensen in regards to him not covering Justin Jefferson or shadowing him on the 97-yard touchdown by Darnold to Jefferson. That was a massive play in that game. That's one time. Not good. This game, Nick Bosa called out Nick Sorensen indirectly, saying like, Look, like what we're taught in film room, what we're taught on tape, like isn't what we're seeing on the field. Like it's different. Like we are not being misled, but it's like there's a disconnect in what we're seeing on the field and the adjustments we have to make on the fly during the game. And Nick Sorensen is five weeks into his tenure in San Francisco. Um, It's a disaster. It's not just his fault. No one's saying that. I'm not saying fire Nick Sorensen, but it's funny. San Francisco fired Steve Wilkes after last season, okay? I agree still with that decision. There was obviously some disconnect in how San Francisco wanted to play defense uh, and what the defensive players were comfortable and had known to play in. Even with that, even with being in the booth and being called down, 
you're still in the Super Bowl, <laughs> and you lost in overtime. And even in that game, you can point to the offense having dry spells of like, oh crap, why are we not scoring? I didn't love Steve Wilkes, but you were in the Super Bowl. You held Travis Kelsey to one catch and one yard in the first half, then Greenlaw's Achilles popped, and everything went to hell. You then walk into this year with, okay, we're going to get back to basics, who we are under Sala and Demeco Ryans. Read and react. Let the edge rushers and the pass rush get home. Let the front seven do their thing so our defense can just play you know, solid coverage. They don't have to be elite. They don't have to make great plays. Just be like 2019. Make their life easier for themselves. Let the pass rush eat. You go and pay for Leonard Floyd. You go and trade for Malik Collins. You go and sign Yitro Gross Matos. You let Armstead go. You bring in, or last year, Javon Hargrave. You get him back in shape. Cool. You don't draft the defensive lineman for whatever reason, but okay. Let's, uh, you know, let's play this aggressive pass rushing defense, but you invest and you sign Isaac Yadam, who starts. You go and you draft Bernardo Green, second round pick. You go get Malik Mustafa. You, you do all these moves that improve the secondary and don't improve the area in which is pivotal for a Nick Sorensen, Robert Sala, and Nemeka Ryan style of defense to succeed. San Francisco today, because of injury for a large part, but of roster construction heading into the year, is more built to play a Steve Wilkes style of defense than they were last year. (laughs) They got better in the secondary, for the most part. They at least invested there this year. They got worse on the pass rushing group, which, okay, Hargrave's out. That makes sense. You're going to get worse there. Gross Matos is hurt. What are you seeing? Not much. Floyd's there, and he got a sack today, but by all means, he had been terrible for the most part of the year. And I like these guys. They're proven talents. But so far through five games, they're proving to you jack squat. They're not living up to the money value they're getting. And it's not up to me to tell people that. Like, you can watch the games and say something's wrong. Why is no one getting a pass rush? Against the mobile quarterback, it's obviously hard. But even then, like... This Niners team is so much more well-equipped to play a Steve Wilkes-style of defensive scheme than a Nick Sorensen one. So what do you do? Bobo says here Steve Wilkes still fielded a top-five defense last year. They weren't top-five to me, but they were certainly top-10, top-12. Again, you were in the Super Bowl winning with that defense. It couldn't have been all that bad. But because he and Kyle didn't see eye-to-eye on things, okay, Let the guy go, whatever. Get back to who you were. There were clear issues last year you shouldn't ignore. But this year, you're taking a chance. If this is the quote-unquote last dance, if this is the we have to win now, where's the winning? There's no second-half adjustments. You're a worse, in this game, you were a worse second-half team than you were a first-half team. And give credit to the Cardinals. They fought and fought and fought. They did not give up like the Rams. But like the Rams, the reason why they kept fighting and fighting and fighting is because San Francisco didn't put them away. The defense cannot stop the run when they get tired. Does the heat hurt you? Maybe. I don't know. But for God's sake, Devondre Campbell, bench him. He's terrible. Get him out of there. They got to sign somebody. But the issue is their their problems aren't fixable by acquiring an XYZ player. You're not going to go out there, you're not going to get a DJ Jones and, oh, our problems are fixed. Not it. This is a schematic issue. It's a coaching issue. So what do you do? Do you fire Nick Sorensen five games in? No. Do you make or give Brandon Staley a bigger role in the defense? I don't think that's the answer. You clearly... You wanted Steve Spagnolo. Chief said, <laughs> screw off, buddy. You wanted Belichick. He was like, nah, I'm good, man. I'll go do TV. Nick Sorensen was the fallback. If everything else fails, we'll go to Sorensen. And sometimes those things work out. But there was no clear cut predecessor, or successor, excuse me, to Steve Wilkes. 
None. It was an emotional get out of here. And it had to happen fine, but it was like, where's the plan? And San Francisco got screwed by playing so late in the playoffs and a lot of the candidates were gone for sure. But it's like San Francisco in a must-win year is banking on rookie defensive coordinators with no play calling experience. Like Nick Sorensen was a, a ball drill guy that knew the system. And I mean, he can coach the system. He can't call the plays just because you know the system. Through five games so far, Nick Sorensen has been a terrible hiring. He may get it fixed for sure. I, 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 if he does, awesome. I want Nick Sorensen to succeed. But through five games, you can't stop the run. In the second half, in the fourth quarter, your defense is terrible on third down. But in the first half, they were great. For all the crap I'm giving the guys, they played a heck of a first half. And they gave San Francisco's offense continual opportunities. They scored points. Brian Schneider's special teams unit scored points <laughs> in this game for the offense. And it's like, what the heck is going on? Like, uh, like, and here's the thing, you know, right now it feels like San Francisco is kind of floundering. They're doggy paddling their way through the year so far. A get a win here, then two losses here. Take one step forward, two steps back. 500, now back below 500. And you can do that as long as you get hot at the right time, right? Okay, you know, you're, you're, you're four and four in week eight. Okay, you're five and five, week 10. You're six and six in week 12. Then you win your next five games. Oh, cool. You know, whew, 11 and six, we're good to go. That can happen for sure. But the longer the season goes, injuries occur. Other players will miss time. God forbid it's somebody big like a Javon Hargrave or a Nick Bosa or Fred Warner or a Brock Purdy, Debo Samuel, which Purdy and Kittle have already missed time this year and you lost that game. But even more so, there seems to be this like, maybe it's a media narrative that I'm seeing or, you know, if they can just survive to get to CMC, once Chris McCaffrey comes back, oh, oh, the offense will get back to who they once were, which... If CMC comes back and he's healthy, I mean, that's a massive upgrade. He's a phenomenal player. He'll pick you up. But the way San Francisco is playing, let's say they lost this game, short week, they're banged up, they're bruised, they got to travel to Seattle. You know, it's a scary environment. It's Lumen Field. What if they lose on Thursday and they're 2-4? and four? They got Kansas City and then they're 2-5. and five. And they go into the bye week three and five. If you're Christian McCaffrey, who has bilateral Achilles tendonitis in both legs and a calf injury, why would you come back? I'm not going to risk my career for a three and five team to hopefully go to the playoffs. San Francisco isn't just playing to win football games. They're playing to convince Christian McCaffrey to return this season. He does not have to. He may want to, and he certainly might. He don't got to come back. He can say, you know what? I'm aging. I've carried the football the second most times since 2022. You know what? I'm banged up, Kyle. I'm bruised. I don't want to tear anything. It's not getting any better. I'm not going to risk my career health. I got a brand new contract. I want to play out my career and my life for the, you know, with being nearly 100% healthy. I'm going to take the year off. I'm sorry, but you're three and five. You're three and six. You're four and six. You're not just playing to win games. You're not just playing to go to the playoffs and the Super Bowl. So far, San Francisco, to me, has done nothing to convince Christian McCaffrey to come back. Why would you? Why would you? I'm sure he will, if he can. That's CMC's nature. He wants to play. He wants to practice. It kills him to not be out there. But... If you're three and five, or you're three and six, why would CMC come back? The odds San Francisco makes the playoffs at three and five, at three and six, slim to none. Slim to none. You are playing to yes win games. Yes, go to the playoffs. 
But so far, because your offense has been absolutely dog crap in the red zone and you can't score the more than 16 points against the Cardinals' 30th ranked offense or defense, excuse me, that has five players with a 100 plus passer rating allowed, with the worst completion percentage rate in football allowed for a secondary in football. You can't score more than 16 points, and your quarterback in this game doesn't go for 300-plus yards and completes 19 freaking passes? You want Christian McCaffrey to come back and risk his career for you? No. (laughs) No freaking way would he do that. And he has every right to say no. There is no guaranteed CMC's back to save the day. Even if if San San Francisco is back to 3-3 next week, And oh, CMC's back, 3-3. and There's no promise that he's the same guy. This idea that he can save the day for them is simply untrue. It's not a guarantee. He might. God, I hope he does. We need you, buddy. We need you. But there is no promise that Chris McCaffrey even comes back this year, let alone San Francisco puts themselves in a position to convince him to come back this year. Everybody hated Jimmy Garoppolo. In 2020, two high ankle sprains. It was terrible. He quit on the team. You ain't going to tell CMC that. You ain't going to do it. You will not have that same energy. I guarantee it. You want to know why? Reading Offensive Player of the Year. He is one of the best offensive players in football. You are not going to carry the same weight for a 3-5 and five team. That's the exact same conversation Jimmy G had in 2020. Of This team is kind of bad. I'm not going to risk my health for them <laughs> like I'll see you in 2021. And guess what? It was the right choice then. And for CMC, if he doesn't come back, because this team is playing terrible football at 3-5 and five and 3-6, and six, if they lose that many games, yeah, don't come back, dude. Get healthy. We'll see you in 2025. I, there's no reason to come back. No reason. And I hate saying that. I want to win games. <laughs> San Francisco should be 5-0. and oh. Should be 5-0. and oh. I do want to highlight some good stuff, though. The defense, first half, really good. Bosa's pick, special teams, I think it was pretty good today for the most part. Um, although Jake Moody snapping his ankle is terrible. <laughs> like, just why are we not kicking the ball out of the back of the end zone every time? Like, just stop doing kick returns. Make them start at the 30 every single time. You wouldn't have a kicker get hurt. You risk no one's health. It's a wash of a play anyways. Just out of the back of the end zone every time. And you don't watch Jake Moody snap his ankle and get a high ankle sprain. Which could have been so much worse. So much worse. Um, But I digress. I thought Brandon Ayuk was phenomenal. For all the absolute vitriol that was thrown his way. And for a large part, rightfully so. You held out. You're not playing well. I told you, I told you coming into this game, this was going to be the IUK game. And not to pat myself on the back, but that was correct. Um, He didn't win, (laughs) which I wish it was accompanied by a win. And unfortunately, because they lost, or or they lost, excuse me, no one's going to care. But IUK was phenomenal. He had six catches for 115 yards in the first half of this game. It was the first time in his entire career hit over 100 yards in the first half. It was a heck of a game. He had eight catches for 147 yards. You can certainly poke holes in only two catches for about, I don't know, what is that, 32 yards in the second half? Like, really? But I thought this the way he started the game, he was pivotal. And getting San Francisco a 10-point lead, a 53-yard, uh, it was a comebacker that went for 53 yards downfield, had a massive yak downfield for him. Uh, third and six, Ayuk goes up and gets it for 16 yards, and you're like, heck to the yes, brother. Uh, B.A.'s back, and B.A. stands for bat ass. That's how he's playing today. Heck yes. Uh, then Purdy, uh, later, uh, completes the comebacker for nine yards on third and 12 Purdy gets uh, the ball to Ayuk, and you're like, he's clutch. Ayuk is back 100%. Like, he's feeling himself. It's a great start. And I think if San Francisco wants to find an answer to their problems, wants to score more points, wants to move the ball downfield more consistently, 
uh, use the slants, utilize deep crossers, shallow crossers, post routes, getting Purdy and Ayuk back, getting their chemistry back together, getting them uh, synchronized is going to go a long way into improving this team's offense as a whole. And what better game to do it in this one? Because you lost, it sucks, and you should have won, and it would have been nice to partner an Ayuk massive game with a victory for sure, but short week, Seattle, Ayuk has confidence, Purdy should be able to, like, look, I'm throwing your way a lot against Seattle. Uh, Ayuk last year was pivotal in beating Seattle in Seattle on Thanksgiving. Um, I think for a team that is looking for answers, Ayuk coming alive and kind of rounding into form in this game is a massive help to finding those answers and solutions to their issues. Um, I thought Kittle was good. He had eight catches, um, you know, one touchdown, 64 yards, had 12 targets. Uh, I thought Kittle's been good. Man, um, I just think that San Francisco just needs help. And as Robbie 439 says here, if CMZ's healthy, he's going to play. And I don't disagree with you, Robbie. Like I said, if CMZ's healthy, he has been chomping at the bit to get out there. He really has. Um, he also says here, I've lost it, folks. I've lost it. Put me in the bin. Put me in a straitjacket. I've lost it. Um, but he says, have you forgotten the terrible starts to seasons and still making it to the NFC Championship game? Robbie referring to 2021 and 22. And to that I say, I haven't forgotten. Those are incredible teams. Being three, even, being three and five and that final overtime game against the Rams at SoFi, it was magical. It was Jawan Jennings being clutch. You know, it was Debo leading the offense one final time before the playoffs began, beating the Cowboys and the Packers and, you know, in, 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 in 4 and 4 in 2022 when Lance plays, then Garoppolo gets hurt, then Purdy comes in and you're like, yes, this is what we need. It's great and all. I haven't forgotten. My point is it's just that, man, this is not those years. This is not those years. Not to say it can't be those years, but. Those teams had very specific issues. It was quarterback in play, two quarterback systems. It was quarterback injuries that were causing problems, mainly in 2022, but the defense was still playing really well. Um, whereas this year, it's your linebacker two is absolutely terrible, which go back and listen to my podcast or on YouTube when they signed Devondre Campbell. I was like, nope, nah, no way. Bad, bad. <laughs> this guy sucks. And I ain't saying that to be so aggressive about it, but it's like, yeah, like he's lost a step. He's been injured. The way he plays linebacker was good for a 2018 NFL, not 2024 NFL. It's not good. <laughs> like, yikes. Um, but I haven't forgotten it's just that your linebacker two is not very good. You're terrible on third downs. You can't score in the red zone. You don't have CMC. Your pass rush can't get home. Your secondary, your safeties mainly aren't very good. You're missing tackles again. Like, I don't want to pile on and be overly negative, but it's like in a game like this, how can you be anything but negative? Um, Robbie responds here and says, the NFC is much worse today than it was in 2020, uh, 2019, excuse me, with Jimmy G as quarterback. No CMC got to the Super Bowl. Dre's coming back. CMC will be back. Have some faith, Sterling. I'll tell you what, Robbie. I have faith. I love my 49ers. I, I, I believe they can steer the ship in the right direction. I believe that a loss like this doesn't you know, put your season in the crapper. You're not flushed away, right? You're you're floating. You are, you are just kind of sitting there with your back in the water, just riding the waves, hoping that someone comes along to put you on the boat, get you on the jet ski, bring you back to shore. Um, and right now, San Francisco, I don't know what that is. I, I, I think one of the biggest things they have to correct is the red zone offense. You fix the red zone offense from... Shanahan to player execution, you score more points. You score more points, you win games. And so uh, the faith isn't gone. It's just kind of waiting for this team to prove it. Like, you have to prove. 
you're good. You have to prove you're worthy of the expectations set upon you. Preseason don't matter. Last year don't matter. It's about 2024. And if and when Dre Greenlaw comes back, cool, man. The odds he's the same player he once was, at least in year one, are not very high. Chris McCaffrey, the odds he flares back up again, fingers crossed, doesn't happen, but pretty high. You know, it's not to say I don't have faith. It's just like having this overly realistic sense of like, this is the season already hasn't gone how it's supposed to. Why would anything else go that way? <laughs> like, man. Um, but Robbie says here that if the Cowboys, Packers, and Sam Darnold, who are standing in your way to the playoffs, that doesn't really scare me. Um, I'd be scared of the Packers for sure. Um, Cowboys are up and down. We will see them soon. <laughs> um, and then Sam Darnold, who already beat you, but... The Vikings are a very, they are an undefeated team that has many holes. And I think they are a team that eventually will lose a home playoff game. Maybe to us. <laughs> Who knows? Hopefully, fingers crossed. But yeah, the Packers do scare me though. And the Lions aren't playing very great football, um, but they're still winning some games. So it's not as if your road is easier. The Vikings being 5-0 and don't help your cause. Um, the, the the odds they just fall off a cliff um, are slim, but possible. Um, Tony Banks, the great, referring to, oh, excuse me, uh, referring to his Rams logo. Niners are cooked, it's over! Maybe. <laughs> At least this year. Uh, Niners Trump says this, though, and I think it's a great point. Um, that let's wait until Thursday. That is what I want to end on today. Let's wait until Thursday. I can hammer home, why isn't Debo Samuel touching the ball more than four times? Why isn't he getting the ball in the red zone? And all the woes and upside downs they've had. But man, man, oh man, oh man. Thursday is a massive game for San Francisco. You win Thursday, you're 3-3, three and three, you beat Seattle, you're 1-2 and two in the NFC West. It don't look too bad no more. It's not perfect. By any means. But it ain't as bad as it looked like previously after losing the game like this. Um, Robbie responds to my point earlier about, you know, having to prove stuff. And he says that, that's the redemption story, Sterling. You're spoiling it. Uh, well, <laughs> we'll see. I, I, I am someone waiting to be proven this team can actually win and hold on to the victories. Against mediocre teams. It hasn't happened, but my fingers are crossed and my my toes are crossed and I'm like praying to the good Lord like, God, the only thing I want in life is a San Francisco 49ers win this Sunday, this Thursday against the Seattle Seahawks. <laughs> I'll be in church in the front row, brother. <laughs> Sign me up as long as San Francisco gets that win. Um, Robbie also says here, um, they go to Minnesota and win and go to the Super Bowl. I'll tell you what, Robbie is one of the most optimistic fans I've ever seen, and I love it. Sometimes after games like this, you need it. You really need the optimism. Good to hear from uh, Smokey the Cat that he won his fantasy football week by .20 points because Rico Dowdle fumbled. Man, I'll tell you what, my opponent this week, if I can bring it up here in a second, uh, my opponent this week in fantasy football I was winning the majority of the week. My opponent, though, looking at our teams currently, he had, I'm currently down. I, I, I'm winning by five points. By five points. Because I had Chris Boswell tonight. He has Travis Kelsey tomorrow. He has Lamar Jackson, 33.4 points. James Cook, 17.9 points. James Conner, 14 points. Thank you, San Francisco 49ers. Terrible run defense for that. Um, he had T. Higgins, 29.3 points. George Kittle, 20.4 points. I mean, my goodness, man. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Um, but I'm happy you won, Smokey the Cat. And uh, let me see up here. Z Money XV said, I'm down by 2.38. I have Wardy. He has Kelty. Uh, I actually don't hate that. You might actually win that one, Z Money, but I digress. Um, what a week five for the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, wasn't great. You lost. Embarrassing. Again. To the NFC West. 
again. Brock Purdy had his worst game of the season by far, in my opinion. Certainly the most two-faced kind of game of, like, first half Brock Purdy is not second half Brock Purdy, but uh, not a great loss. A really bad loss, to be in fact, against a bad team that, as of now, I believe you are in third place in the NFC West behind the Seattle Seahawks and the Arizona Cardinals after they beat you today. And the Cardinals also beat the Rams earlier this year. So they're 2-0 in the NFC West. San Francisco's 0-2. The Rams are 1-1. And right now it is Seattle with a relatively commanding couple-game lead over the teams uh, behind them. Then it's Niners and Cardinals, 2-3. and three. <laughs> Just not where we thought we'd be by week five but that's why you got 18 weeks and 17 games in the nfl season you can always claw your way back up hope they do that and if you want to see any of those games this year don't forget to use our promo code 49ers access 49 ers acc ess at seatgeek.com to save yourself $20 off your first purchase. You can also follow us on social media at 49ers.access is the Instagram. 49ers underscore access is the Twitter. And if you're tired of looking at 13 different websites and sources to find your news, ESPN, Fox, Sporting News, uh, San Francisco Chronicle, you're tired of going to YouTube and your podcasting platforms to find stuff like a video like this, forget all that. Go to sportsspider.com, find your favorite team. If you're a Cardinals fan, uh, you won today, thumbs up. If you're a Niner fan, sportsspider.com, you can sort by your favorite team and your favorite sport and find everything you need, latest news, articles, podcasts of that team in one place to streamline how you digest your sporting news. And look, folks, Tough week five. We're going to bounce back in week six, hopefully. Season's not lost, but uh, how about a way to bounce back and pluck some Seattle Seahawk feathers? Wouldn't that be uh, quite dandy, if you will, to kick off week six? Thursday night football, Lumen Field, Seattle Seahawks against the San Francisco 49ers. Got to win. Another must win game for San Francisco until Wednesday. When we preview that game, I want you to wait, like, share, and subscribe to this video. Go to the audio podcasting platform, Spotify, Google, Apple. Give us a five-star review. Tell me what your biggest takeaway was from this loss down below in the comments. What did Brock Purdy do? What did you like? What did you dislike? What was the biggest flaw that led to San Francisco's loss in this game? Tell me down below in the comments, and hopefully we can... Um, work through the loss together, flush it, and focus on week six against the Seattle Seahawks this Thursday. Uh, that preview of that game will come out this Wednesday live on this YouTube channel, so stay tuned for that. And as always, thank you to Tony Banks, the great Robbie 439, Niner Trump, Smokey the Cat, who won his fantasy football league this week. Um, uh, let's see, Lori Matthews. Jim Everett, the great Z Money XV, Bobo is also in here. Niners Throwback also in here. Rick Diaz also in here. Thank you all so much for liking, sharing, and subscribing. And until next time, my name is Sterling Bennett. And even despite the loss, stay faithful.